Hi everyone, and welcome back to the AIS series Remote Control, where we explore the creative teams behind the scenes using the latest technology to bring our favorite stories to life on screens big and small. I'm Buzz Hayes, Global Lead for Google's Entertainment Industry Solutions and Chairman of the Advanced Imaging Society, and I'm excited to host this episode of Remote Control featuring the editor behind the award-winning docuseries The Beatles Get Back, directed by Oscar winner Peter Jackson. The series took Peter Jackson and his team on a four-year odyssey that started when Apple Corps, owners of the vault of unseen footage from the Beatles' Let It Be album and the documentary, approached Jackson in the summer of 2017 about applying his storytelling touch to the material. Four years, a global pandemic, and the submission of an unauthorized running time cut to Disney Plus later, and the documentary The Beatles Get Back emerged to a Television Critics Association award win and five Emmy nominations. Today, we're joined by Jabez Olson, Peter Jackson's editor for the series, who's already won an Eddie Award and is nominated for an Emmy for his work on the project. And for the audiophiles in our audience, please check out our bonus episode, where we'll be joined by sound mixer Mike Hedges and sound editor Martin Kwok, who both also received Emmy nods for their groundbreaking audio work on the series. But first, let's welcome Peter Jackson's longtime editor, Jabez Olson. In addition to his work on Get Back, Jabez also worked on Peter Jackson's previous documentary on World War I, They Shall Not Grow Old, as well as The Hobbit Trilogy. Welcome, Jabez. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. We have some great footage the team at Wingnut Films shared with us, and we'd like to share it with you now. But first, tell us a little bit about how Peter Jackson first approached you with the opportunity to create a documentary with never-before-seen material from the original Beatles' Let It Be footage. Well, um, Peter's uh, always been a Beatles fan, as have I, and so that's something we um, have had in common and we've often talked about over the years. Um, and Peter uh, somehow got approached by Apple to come and visit them while he was in London, and um, he went in there to talk about various things, and um, uh, eventually that led to him going in to watch... Uh, the outtakes from the uh, the Let It Be film from 60 years ago, or the Get Back sessions as they were known. Um, and I just remember getting an email from him that night after he'd done his first day of watching the material. And, you know, he was just amazed that what he was seeing wasn't what he feared it might be. You know, there's a, there was a lot of um, talk about how miserable that time was and that, that was sort of the reputation the film and those sessions had. And that wasn't what he saw when he sat down and watched the rushes. And um, so he couldn't wait to sort of, you know, write this very long email explaining it all to me and how, you know, what he saw, was, you know, four guys who were getting on, and you know, happy together and making music. And um, he just got really excited by it. And yeah, the, the next thing you know, we're, uh, we're working on a documentary. So Jabez, I understand that there was approximately 60 hours of footage to review that was originally shot by Michael Lindsay Hogg in 1969. What were some of the particular moments you saw in looking at the material for the first time that you were just immediately grabbed by and you knew had to make it into the final cut? The first footage that we saw and that Peter watched when he went to Apple to view it was a, a tally scene done in the 1990s, probably for the um, anthology project. Um, so all the footage had been you know, telecine to videotape, um, and where possible audio had been sunk to it, but that was um, not an easy process. It, it also meant there was actually 130 hours of audio recorded for, for this project. But of course, when they, in the 90s, when they telecine the footage, they only telecine the picture they had, which was 60 hours. Um, so it was picture to picture with none of the missing audio that continued on between um, takes. So um, that was what we first saw, and that was, you know, standard def uh, uh, video from the 90s. And, um, it, you know, it, it didn't look great. It looked better than a lot of the, the bootlegs that have leaked over the years have looked, but it was still of its time. Um, but the first thing I really looked at was a a film scan of all the the film footage that then had a quick sort of one light restoration done to it. Um, it was a lot better than anything we'd seen before, but we didn't want to 
slow down the editing process while we waited for all 60 hours to be restored. So it, it sort of got a, a quick um, pass and then we brought it into the Avid and we started editing. The, the, it was only the material that we then selected and put into the final film that got the, the absolute best restoration and color grading. How much time did you and Peter spend together in the edit bay? And what was the main focus of the time you spent together working on the edit? We have a you know a, a decent sized room that we work in, and we have a, a a small cinema screen and some couches in front of it. And Peter will sit on the couch and watch the big screen, and I will sit um, to the side at an avid. And um, you know the the first you know the, the editing process changes during the different stages of uh, post production. Uh, initially, we would spend days just watching the footage. Uh, making selects, talking about it, um, and you know, putting I would be putting shots into bins, all the favourite shots, all you know, all the potential moments, um, and then you know, we would start, we, we would pick a what we would call a scene, you know, where the real life can be broken into scenes. I'm not sure, but we would pick, say, a song that the Beatles were doing or a discussion they were having, and we would lay it out on the timeline and um, compact it, you know, sort of get it to what dialogue wise and with the pictures we had create what we thought the the story should be what what made an interesting scene but there were always holes in it because the they were only shooting with two cameras for most of the uh, the shoot and those two cameras were 16 mil cameras that could hold about 10 minutes of film each and film was expensive so the cameras weren't shooting film all the time um, in fact, you know, there's there's very few uh, examples of an entire song being, uh, you know, filmed from one end to the other. That usually the camera will turn off a few times, and um, and it's also it's it's unusual that both cameras would be running at the same time. You know, it, it, it does happen, but they weren't sort of working um, in unity together. They were sort of you know um, shooting their own thing. So when we put a scene together, we would have a lot of holes. And then it was a matter of searching the surrounding areas for representative shots that um, worked to uh, to fill in and to uh, glue everything together. And um, that's sort of where the art came in. And um, it was a tricky process because some there were some great moments that we had just as audio and we had almost no picture for them at all. And um, <laughs> we had to put something there. So it looks like we have a, a clip that comes from the series that the team shared with us. And I think it really sort of encapsulates the overarching theme of the series, the idea that while maybe from the outside looking in and maybe even at, at times internally, there were struggles at this stage in the, these, you know, these four boys from Liverpool's relationship. But in this scene, we see them using their music to both escape and poke fun at those negative comments. And then they end up uniting and harmonizing in the process of recording the music together. Can you tell us a little bit about the potential you and Peter saw in this scene and what went into constructing it? Yeah, this is a scene I like because I think it sort of um, comes out quite well. Um, what I really like is that I like the way Paul and John are working together here, even though some people see them as um, like that John's trying to sing over Paul, but I, I don't think that's what's happening. I, I just think the music John's playing works really well with uh, what Paul's doing is, you know, Paul's reading this newspaper article, but he's making fun of it. And, you know, the fact that he's reading it aloud, you know, sort of sh shows very clearly that none of the article is true. And this is an article that has gone on to give these get back sessions a, a, a a reputation for um, that they don't deserve, and I think you know that's that's demonstrated quite clearly um, with what they you know say about the article right here, just you know a day or two after it happened, um, and you know there's obviously nothing in the article that um, that they feel they they can't laugh at, um, so nothing's cutting too close to home. Um, well, it's the it's a scene that. The first time I actually assembled it was during the the, lo the lockdown we had here in New Zealand, and um, I assembled it at my house, and then I sent it to Peter. And um, uh, but you know we did a lot of work on it together once um, the lockdown was over. But initially, um, 
I was quite pleased that we our researchers had found this um, article that they're reading. You know, we, we had got a scan of it. And so I was able to fill in a lot of black holes by cutting to the article and highlighting the, the lines that Paul was obviously reading. And I think what works nicely there is Paul's changing the words quite often. He's um, making fun of them. He's taking them out of context or flipping them around or um, paraphrasing them in an amusing way. So it's quite good to see what the actual text said um, to juxtapose that with what Paul turned it into. Um, and that helped a lot because, as I say, we, we're often missing picture in these uh, initial, uh, in the initial coverage that we got on these scenes. Um, and you know, I, I also was quite happy with the montage work we did of them playing through this. And I think you know we're cutting between a number of areas where we're cutting you know some shots in the control room, some you know musical instrument shots. John singing, George playing. You know, occasionally you see the little cheats we've done, like when Paul first picks up the newspaper, we cut to an insert that Michael had shot earlier of that front page. So, you know, and that's, um, Michael did some great inserts for us like that. He, he, you know, he got a few B shots, the B roll shots that were quite useful. And that was one of them. But, um, you know, he got the front page. And then we, you know, 50 years later, got a scan of that newspaper and we digitally created the inserts of the uh, of the actual lines. That's amazing. Well, let's take a look at this clip um, where Paul's reading the, the very unflattering article on the, on the group and let's see how the band reacts and then channels it into the music. Let's take a look. Uh, I woke up this morning and I look out my door I can tell that old milk cow I can tell the way she walks in front of me The end of a beautiful friendship By Michael House, go home The awful tension of being locked in each other's arms snapped last night at a TV rehearsal and Beatles, John, George, Paul, and Harold, at very least, a few vicious phrases took place. He, the mystical one who lost so much of the Beatles' magic. <laughs> she, the nudie. It's only the suddenness of their decline from the status of boys next door to the category of weirdies that has left most people at gone. It would be about the middle of 1960 that the personal luster of the Beatles began to show a few spots of rust. I will deliberately leave Ringo out of it because he has never developed an inclination towards the bizarre. Lennon was married happily, McCartney was going steady, and George Harrison was about to marry. Everything in the Beatle garden was rosy. But that was a long time ago. They went their own private ways, found their own friends, and became res reliant on each other for guidance and comradeship. Where did it all lead to? I suppose it is only fair to say that they're pretty close to disaster at one time or another. Today, all of them find acute embarrassment at the stories of one another's old ball adventures and ponder. Harrison's escapade with his favorite mystic from India left Paul and Ringo aghast and both felt applied to try him out to see if they were missing anything. Nothing to lose it, hey! Drugs, divorce, and a slipping image played desperately on their minds. Yeah, and it appeared to them all that the public was being encouraged hey. to hate them. They don't need no rhythm or blues. They got nothing to lose. Early in the morning, I'm a giving you the warning. Don't you step on my blue sweat shoes. But that still doesn't amount to a complete breakup of the group. 
Whatever talent they have as individuals and who can deny it, their capacity to earn is largely tied up in their performances as a group. And until they are either rich enough for that, not to matter, nor a feather, enough they all stay together because of the economic necessity. But I can't say definitely that, as the friendly foursome tied irrevocably to when each I other, the news details, it's all tonight. over. They will never be exactly the, the same news. again. Everybody's rocking tonight. Okay. Okay. Okay, then. Are you ready, George? Here we go, Glenn. Coming ready or not. Glenn, you're up. Okay, boys and girls. Okay. All I want is you. Take one. Yeah. And now, your host for this evening, the bottle. Oh! <laughs> Everyone you know Yes, you can imitate Everyone you know I told you so All I want is you Everything has got to be Just like you want it to The series culminates in the iconic final live concert performance on the rooftop in London. You took a creative approach in editing this footage, showing a great juxtaposition of reactions from the people that gathered to see what would be their last public performance. And some of the concerns, of course, from law enforcement during that concert. There's some great scenes using split screen where we see the different reactions in real time. Um, we also see the band in harmony together for what will be the last performance, although we don't know that yet. Um, tell us a little bit about what went into creating this performance element of the series. And if you can, what was your and Peter's own emotional reaction to what would be now known as the final performance of the Beatles? Yeah, this um, whole section was very different to cut than the, than the rest of the project. Um, for, for most of the, the Get Back sessions, uh, Michael had been filming with two 16 mil handheld cameras. Um, and then for the rooftop day, he brought in a whole lot more cameras. Um, and now I'm forgetting off the top of my head the exact number, but it was something like five or six on the rooftop, three down on the street, one hidden in the foyer to film any police that might happen to turn up. Um, so yeah, it was 10 or a dozen like, cameras and all, which was, you know, made the cutting very different because they also, they, they had bigger magazines on them, these cameras, and they could film for a lot longer. So they did. And we had great coverage for the whole day from multiple um, angles. Um, and that made, yeah, cutting this day very different. That's amazing. Well, let's take a look at this clip um, now known as the final performance of the Beatles.
the top of the roof. Well, it's uh, to do something out of the ordinary. I mean, uh, all that money the, they've the, got. Uh, do you know what music you're listening to at the moment? No, I have no idea, but it sounds really wonderful. Really. You like it, do you? Yes. Well, this is the Beatles playing on the roof. It's their first uh, public appearance of some time. Yes. And do you quite enjoy the music? You oh, yes. Do you find the Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like to hear every lunchtime? Yes. <laughs> you're listening to? The Beatles, obviously. The Beatles? Yeah. Yes. And um, this music you're now listening to is going to be uh, on their new LP coming out very shortly. You like it? Fabulous. Yeah, definitely. You Fantastic. Right, Have you any favourite amongst the Beatles or are, are they all your favourites? Uh, they're all a few lads. Yeah. Really <laughs> get around, don't they? So they get around? <laughs> oh, I think the Beatles are cracking. I said, oh, you can't beat them. I said, oh, they're all out on their own, they've got a style of their own. And they, uh, well, it's my opinion, I think they've got a, a lovely, lovely crowd. They've got good, good quality, they sing well. And, uh, well, what else can I say but that they're, they're all good people. Mr. Reed, that's the one, I think. That's it, lovely. Anywhere where I could have a listen to this. Um, would you like to see them back again? Yes, very much. You would. Yes. You really like their music. Yes. Great. Have you a favourite amongst the Beatles? Um, I think Ringo. Hello. Do you know what music you're listening to at the moment? No. Do you? No. You're listening to the Beatles music. You've heard of the Beatles, yeah? Yeah. Do you like their music? Yeah, I think they're good. You don't disapprove them. Well, I don't disapprove of the Beatles there. I don't disapprove of their style at all. Wouldn't mind your daughter going out to the Beatles. I don't mind them because they've got money.
been great talking with you jay but i do have one final thing as a fan of the beatles yourself did this project and, and the series that came from it in any way change your opinion of the band and this sort of seminal final act of theirs and if so how well yeah i mean i think like everyone it gave me a much greater appreciation of these um get back sessions um they had you know such a terrible reputation it was supposed to be miserable and the breakup of the band and you know that just wasn't the case they you know they went on to do another album after this um whatever happened after january 1969 i think at the time they you know they were fine together they you know occasionally would get grumpy with each other but you know who working in such close you know <laughs> confinement wouldn't get grumpy occasionally i think they probably had much worse fights at other times that just weren't recorded um and what this, what's special about this project to me is that you get to see that even these creative geniuses had to work at um, what they were doing. It, there were multiple iterations of their songs. They had to refine them, um, keep working away. And, you know, the genius didn't just come instantly like a lightning bolt. They, they all had to work together and make each other better. And, you know, there was, there's such a comforting thought that, you know, that genius really is 99% perspiration. And um, that's what I think, you know, this film shows you that, you know, hard work and working together um, really can pay off. Well, that's amazing. Well, Jabez, I can't thank you enough for your time and your incredible insights you. on this project. 
and the impact it's had on the legacy of clearly the most iconic band and music in history. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Much appreciated. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for this episode of Remote Control, but be sure to check out our bonus episode for this show featuring the award-winning post-production audio team behind this groundbreaking series. And of course, thank you to our guest today, editor Jabez Olson. We look forward to continuing to see your work in the future, and we hope to hear your name called at the Emmys in September. Well, be sure to like this episode, share your comments, and subscribe to the AIS channel. We want to thank Gary Radburn and Matt Allard at Dell, Rick Champagne and NVIDIA, the NAB Show, Computer Graphics World, and Post Magazine, Michael Mansuri and Meatmo for their Meatmo production platform. And of course, special thanks to Wingnut Films, Apple Core, and Disney Plus for sharing their talented team and some of the materials behind their documentary series, The Beatles Get Back. Thank you for watching this episode of AIS Remote Control, brought to you by Dell.